You got like a warrant out. So don't give me. I'm gonna do you up. Oh. Yeah, but in his world, it's just a DUI. Oh, DUI. He's had worse. He got a DUI. I know, but Harvey, he's also had multiple charges that are 20 times worse than DUI. I done produced a song for him, met him a couple times. I ain't think none of him was wrong. I opened the door, boom. He pushed me in. A behind him got a Draco AK-47 look at thing. He started hitting me in the face. Tato started hitting me in the face. Who do you think is responsible for your son's death? Chief Keefe. Himself pulled the trigger? I don't believe him, him his, his self pulled the trigger. I believe he paid somebody to do it. Chief Keef is undeniably one of the most influential rappers in hip hop history, and he started making waves in the game at just 15 years old. Hailing from the south side of Chicago, Chief Keef became one of the first artists to really bring Chicago drill music into the mainstream. But apparently, Sosa is not just playing. He really is about that life. With a rap sheet that would make hardcore gangsters ashamed, Chief Keef has had a wild criminal career beyond his music. His raw, aggressive style, often referred to as demonic, was unlike anything anyone had ever heard before. It didn't just catch the attention of the streets, it had suburban kids, celebrities, and everyone in between eagerly waiting for his next track to drop. Even A-list celebrities became major fans of Chief Keef. Take 50 Cent, for example. He's praised Keef several times in interviews, which is notable since 50 doesn't often give his stamp of approval to up-and-coming rappers. When Chief Keef come around for the first time, I fall in love with Chief Keef because I look at him and I see that he's just, he just has Chicago influences. Said the shit that he really feel, like fake true religion genes, don't like. Yeah, Chief Keef like, yo, he's hot, like, he, he would my son, Chief Keep is what my son would have been if we didn't make it at that point. The significance is someone who's completely affected by the environment. Then there's Kanye West, who's jumped on the remix of Keefe's track, I Don't Like, catapulting his career even further into the spotlight. Clone like, pay homage or case vomit, ungrateful niggas I don't like. Rah! With co-signs from rap royalty like that, Chief Keef was destined to be a household name. But it wasn't just the beats or the co-signs that made Keef and the Chicago drill scene explode. It was the authenticity in his lyrics. Keef wasn't just rapping for the sake of it, he was talking about real-life experiences, both his own and those around him. Whether he was the one doing the dirt or just affiliated with people who did, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that Chief Keef was speaking the truth. His music videos were gritty, his lyrics were raw, and everyone could see that Sosa was really about that life, and his rap sheet and the reputation of his crew only solidified that image. Let's dive in deeper. Named after his uncle Keith Carter, aka Big Keith, Chief Keith grew up in one of Chicago's most dangerous neighborhoods, Parkway Gardens, also known as Oblock. Located in the Washington Park area on the south side, Oblock is notorious for being one of the most dangerous places in the city, if not the country. The area is predominantly controlled by the Black Disciples, BDs, a gang that Chief Keefe became associated with from a young age. Even though Keefe was growing up in the midst of violence and gang activity, his passion for music was there from the start. He recalls memories of himself as a five-year-old freestyling on his mom's karaoke machine. He'd pop blank tapes into the machine and record over some basic weak beats, his words. But by 2008, at just 12 years old, Keef started taking music more seriously, recording full-length songs and putting them out. It was around this time that he met DJ Ken, a Japanese music producer who had recently moved to Chicago. The two met through Keef's uncle, Big Keef, who was out walking his dog one day when he bumped into DJ Ken. After chatting about music, they decided to start working together. Over the next couple of years, Chief Keef and DJ Ken would record a bunch of tracks while figuring out their process. In 2009, when Keef was only 14, he and DJ Ken dropped their first small mixtape, UFO Overload. It's tough to find online now since most of it has been wiped from the internet, but a few tracks still exist if you dig hard enough. One standout track from the tape is Dead and Gone, which Keef wrote for a girl named Keita who had passed away. I know it. I know it. I 
The song gives us a glimpse of Keefe's early style, which was much more laid back compared to the high energy drill beats he would later become known for. But things started to shift in 2010 when Chief Keefe and DJ Ken released Moolah Express. This project had more of that drill energy and showed how far Keefe had come in just a short time. His music was getting harder, the lyrics grittier, and it was clear he was evolving. Around this time, Keefe dropped out of Diet High School for reasons that remain unclear. But as his music career started to take off, so did his involvement in the streets. In early 2011, when Chief Keefe was still a teenager, he found himself in trouble with the law, getting arrested on charges related to H manufacturing and distribution. Since he was a juvenile at the time, the court declared him delinquent rather than guilty, placing him on house arrest. But even while confined to his home, Keefe's focus never wavered. He channeled all his energy into his music and dropped two mixtapes that same year, The Glory Road and, shortly after, Bang. It was Bang that really started to turn heads. With its raw lyrics and hard-hitting beats, the mixtape caught fire on the streets of Chicago. The momentum only grew when the Bang music video dropped online and suddenly Chief Keefe wasn't just another kid from the South Side trying to rap. He was a 16-year-old documenting the harsh reality of his life and people were starting to notice. However, Keefe's run-ins with the law didn't stop. Later that year, he found himself in another dangerous situation. While leaving his grandmother's house, he was stopped by a police officer. Keefe was holding a coat over his hands, and when the officer approached, Keefe dropped the coat and flashed a gun before running away. The officer chased him down the block, with Keefe turning back several times to point the gun at the cop, which caused the officer to fire a few shots, barely missing Keefe. Eventually, he was caught and arrested, facing multiple counts of aggravated assault and unlawful use of a firearm. He ended up back on house arrest, this time confined to his grandmother's house. But rather than letting that confinement slow him down, Keefe used the time to sharpen his skills. It was during this period that he connected with producer Young Chop, a meeting that would forever change the sound of Chicago drill music. The two started working out of his grandmother's house, creating song after song, and it wasn't long before they struck gold. On March 6, 2012, Chief Keefe uploaded a track called I Don't Like, featuring Lil Reese to YouTube. He even labeled the track as leaked, a tactic he often used to create buzz. A fart, that's that sh I don't like. No. A snitch, it worked. Within a short time, the song was blowing up locally, racking up over 50,000 views on YouTube. But the real game changer was when Chicago rap legend Kanye West took notice. Wasting no time, Kanye hopped on the remix of I Don't Like, bringing along heavy hitters like Pusha T, Big Sean, and Jada Kiss. Don't like, pay homage or K's vomit, ungrateful n I don't like. Rah. How did you feel when Kanye West, which was the king of the shy at the mm -hmm. time, jumped on your uh, I was like, come on, dog. I know what that feeling got to uh, feel like. Nah. I mean, I, I, I didn't think it was true, though. The remix blew up, and suddenly, Chief Keefe wasn't just a local sensation. He had the entire country talking about him. A local party promoter even called the track the perfect Chicago song because, as he put it, people just hate everything out here. At just 16 years old, Keefe had gone from being a kid on house arrest to a household name in hip hop practically overnight. With everyone watching, he kept the momentum going, releasing four mixtapes within a span of just six months, all leading up to his highly anticipated debut album. The hype around Keefe sparked a massive bidding war between record labels, all vying to sign the young superstar. In the end, he inked a deal with Interscope Records records, which was reportedly worth over $6 million over three years. The deal also included a second contract for his Glory Boys Entertainment GBE crew, which meant his entire team was now on the map. However, as great as the deal sounded, it came with some strings attached. One big catch was that if his debut album didn't sell at least a quarter of a million copies by a certain date, Interscope had the option to drop Chief Keefe from the label. Even after signing his massive deal with Interscope in 2012, Chief Keefe was still heavily involved in the streets. The fame and money didn't pull him out of that lifestyle just yet. In September of that same year, the Chicago PD announced that Keefe was being investigated in connection with the death of fellow Chicago rapper Lil Jojo. Jojo, also a drill artist, had made serious waves in the city with his track 300K BDK, where he boldly dissed the Black Disciples and even called out specific names. Dirt safe squad, so I can't wait to catch him. Squeeze this 
of 40. It was a bold move that put him directly in the crosshairs of the violent gang culture that dominated the Chicago drill scene at the time. When people think of Chicago nowadays, it's hard not to associate the city with violence. Sadly, it's become so normal for discussions about Chicago to include references to its gang wars and the violence that comes with it. One of the most infamous beefs that came out of this era of Chirac was the conflict between two rival gangs, 300 and 069 Brick Squad. At the center of this war were Chief Keef representing 300 and Lil Jojo from Brick Squad. Chief Keef was affiliated with the 300 Lamron set, which was part of the BD Black Disciples faction. While Lil Jojo was associated with 069 Brick Squad, a GD Gangster Disciples set. But Jojo's ties ran even deeper. He was part of the Insane GDs, which added another layer of violence to the mix. The Insane GDs didn't just go after BDs, they would go after anyone, BD or GD, if they were considered an op. JoJo's affiliation made him a fierce player in the street wars, and even though he was young, he was far from innocent in the streets. He and his brother Swag De Niro had been active in the gang life from an early age, having grown up in a family steeped in GD culture. Chief Keef, on the other hand, wasn't just some rapper playing tough. He was just as dangerous and reckless as Lil Jojo. Both of them came from environments where survival often meant being the most ruthless person in the room. So it was almost inevitable that their paths would clash given their affiliations. The BD versus GD war in Chicago had been raging for decades before either of them was even born. And both Keef and Jojo became symbols of this ongoing feud. What really set off the beef between them though wasn't even directly related to Chief Keef at first. It actually started with his close associate at the time, Lil Durk. On March 28, 2012, Durk dropped a track that would change everything, L's Anthem. In the song, Durk dissed Brick Squad, rapping, Brick Squad, I say F him, Wugga World with him, so it's F him. Wugga World was another set of GDs affiliated with Brick Squad, so they got pulled into the beef as well. Brick Squad, I say World with him, so L's anthem quickly became one of the most infamous Chicago diss tracks, and when Jojo and his brother Swag De Niro heard it on the radio, it was game over. Jojo was furious. His set had just been disrespected on a massive platform. He turned to his brother and said, You heard that, bro? Hell nah. We gonna go crazy. That's it. He didn't really want to rap until he heard Lil Durk's song at L's anthem. Because we heard it on the radio. Like, we driving, you know? It was me and him. I remember we driving. Boom. He said, He said, Bird Squad, we safe. Boom. Like, this on the radio. He goes on the radio. Man, he went crazy. We ain't like that. He said, he said, you heard that, bro? Hell no, we finna go crazy. That's it. After that, it's who... He was going crazy, bro. JoJo wasn't even really rapping like that at the time, but the diss track motivated him to jump into the booth to respond. That decision would set off a chain of events that no one could have predicted. On April 27th, 2012, Lil JoJo dropped a remix of Chief Keef's Every Day and called it BDK 300K. For context, 300 is a collective of various BD sets in Chicago, including Chief Keef, Lil Reese, and Lil Durk. But JoJo didn't just take aim at those rappers, he dissed the entire Black Disciple gang by naming the song BDK, which stands for Black Disciple In the track, Jojo boldly rapped, These rappers claim 300, but we BDK, letting the whole city know where he stood. These niggas claim 300, but we BDK. On the track, he also responded directly to Dirk, rapping, Dirk say F Brick Squad, so I can't wait to catch him, squeeze this effing 40, now they got him on a stretcher. Dirk say Squad, so I can't wait to catch him, Get it. squeeze this this wasn't just another diss track, it became an anthem for GD rappers in Chicago who were beefing with the BDs, sparking an uptick in violence across the city. Lil Jojo's diss lit a fuse that would lead to one of the bloodiest chapters in Chicago's gang history. The song BDK not only disrespected Jojo's rivals, but enraged their entire neighborhood. By targeting Chief Keef, Lil Durk, Lil Reese, and the entire BD gang, Jojo basically put a target on his own back. What was the old block reaction? Reaction to that song. What, what, what was you know you living in O Block? What was the initial reaction like? Like the, the initial reaction was he finna die. He came out with that song, man. But I, I said that go his death ticket. That's what I thought. And rest in peace to Lil Jojo. I wish that all of us would have had an opportunity to live a different life. But in my mind, back then, I'm like, oh, sure he gonna die. He uh, assure you he got death coming, making a song like that. With tensions already high between rival gangs, this diss track pushed things to the brink. Less than a day after dropping his 300k diss on September 1st, Jojo continued his rampage by releasing other diss tracks like the I Got That Sack freestyle, throwing more shots at his rivals. He wasn't backing down, in fact. The success of the song only fueled his ego. 
Jojo was getting more attention and with that he pushed harder, continuing to poke at the BDs. He even took the beef to social media, tweeting things like 5,000 effing views in one day, tonight go make two days, but F Lil Dirk, I'm not even going to diss him no more, he don't want no smoke, and Lil Dirk say stop writing, shorty you giving him shine, LMAO. Fam, you started this ish when you said F Brick Squad, but we're ready for whatever. These taunts sparked a back and forth with Lil Dirk, Lil Reese, and others, and soon death threats started flying in Jojo's direction. Lil Jojo's decision to keep pressing his rivals turned out to be a fatal mistake. Not long after the diss tracks, Jojo allegedly spotted Lil Reese in traffic. Feeling like he had the upper hand, Jojo and his crew tailed Reese's car, shouting threats like, Reese ain't even driving, he a B, I'm a K is A. Jojo even tweeted about the incident, laughing it off and taunting Reese for not taking any action. But while Jojo was busy bragging online, he missed the fact that he had left his enemies with even more hate in their hearts. Jojo kept pushing. He continued to taunt his enemies by driving through their hood and posting a picture online to prove it. This was his way of showing that he wasn't scared, but in reality, he was only feeding the fire. On September 4th, 2012, Jojo made a move that sealed his fate. At around 4.04 p.m., he and his crew rolled through his rival's turf again, with Lil Reese reportedly in the area. Jojo mocked them, doing everything he could to get under their skin. His taunts worked. Lil Reese allegedly told him, I'ma off you, making it clear that this wasn't just talk anymore. Yeah. Instead of backing off, Jojo doubled down. He called Reese out online again, posting, I am out here on my two feet, where you at? Jojo felt untouchable, but this time his bravado would cost him. At around 6.13 p.m., Jojo took things a step further, posting his exact location on Twitter. I'm on 069, I'm out here. This was a bold and reckless move, an open invitation for his rivals to come find him. It didn't take long for them to respond. Around 7.30 p.m., Jojo was sitting on the handlebars of a bike being ridden by one of his affiliates near 70th Street and Princeton Avenue. According to police reports, a four-door sedan pulled up behind them, followed by two other vehicles. Someone in the front seat of the sedan opened fire, hitting Jojo at the corner of 70th and Princeton. Jojo tried to run, but he collapsed on the sidewalk at 6954 South Princeton. He was rushed to Comer Children's Hospital, but it was too late. Lil Jojo was pronounced dead at 9.03 p.m. on September 4, 2012. The news quickly picked up the story, with many outlets linking Jojo's M to his ongoing beef with BD affiliates Chief Keef, Lil Dirk, and Lil Reese. In the aftermath of Jojo's death, his rivals wasted no time mocking his passing. But Chief Keefe's reaction stood out the most. His tweets immediately following JoJo's M raised a lot of suspicion. Keefe tweeted out a series of messages that many felt were in poor taste as he laughed hysterically about JoJo's death. He later claimed his account had been hacked and that he didn't even know who Lil JoJo was. But the damage had already been done. A lot of people were already pointing fingers at him, speculating that Keefe had a hand in orchestrating the M. Lil JoJo's family, especially his mother and brother, were convinced that Chief Keefe was behind the hit. In a televised interview, JoJo's mom outright accused Keefe of hiring people from his gang to take her son's life. You think is responsible for your son's death? Chief Keefe. Himself pulled the trigger? I don't believe him, him his, his self pulled the trigger. I believe he paid somebody to do it. Swag De Niro also echoed these claims. His mother's accusations were soon backed up by one of JoJo's affiliates who stated in an interview, quote, we heard them rap dudes put money on bro's head. We heard them, um, JoJo boy, we heard them all uh, and rap put money on bro head too. This only fueled more speculation that Keefe had greenlit the hit. Chief Keefe's cousin, Tato, would also post online naming D. Rose, Fredo Santana, and Kiki, Keefe's affiliates, as the people who allegedly carried out the M. These posts only added more weight to the rumors surrounding Keefe's involvement. The speculation didn't stop there. Swag De Niro also commented online about the shooter, further hinting that retaliation had already taken place. He made a cryptic statement that the person responsible for JoJo's death had already been Cade. In an interview, Swag seemed to confirm this, stating that after leaving the hospital where JoJo had died, he and his uncle did what they did that night. Many took this to mean that Swag and his family had gotten revenge on JoJo's care. I said, take him to him, and he said, he's gone already. There's nothing else to talk about. 
I left out here, yeah, I tear, I was crying like a mother. But I went like sad and was mad crying. You know, I, caught, I, I looked at Unc, man, and we left. We hopped and we went and we did what we did that night. The rumors of retaliation weren't just street talk. Police reports confirmed that just two weeks after Lil Jojo was offed on September 17th, 2012, Chief Keef's affiliate Keith Bonds, also known as Kiki, was gunned down. Authorities believe that Kiki's M was directly related to Lil Jojo's death, a grim retaliation for what had happened. Chief Keef's debut album, Finally Rich, dropped on December 18th, 2012, and marked a major moment in his career. The album sold 50,000 spots in its first week and debuted at number 29 on the Billboard 200. It was a solid start for the 17-year-old who had been living with his grandma just a year before. The tape was packed with hits like Love Sosa, Don't Like, and Hate Being Sober, tracks that would become anthems in the drill scene and solidified Keefe as a force in hip-hop. But despite the buzz and fan support, the album didn't hit the numbers Interscope had hoped for. This set the stage for a rocky relationship between Sosa and the label. Interscope wanted big numbers, but Keefe was more focused on his lifestyle and staying true to his roots. He missed multiple shows, often without explanation, and kept finding himself in trouble with the law. He violated his probation more than once, leading critics and industry insiders to wonder if Chief Keefe was going to be another case of a young star burning out too soon. The tension between him and Interscope continued to build, and eventually the label decided to drop him altogether. But getting dropped didn't stop Keefe. It just pushed him in a different direction. After parting ways with Interscope, Keith made a major move. He relocated to Los Angeles. Moving to LA turned out to be a positive shift for him. He distanced himself from the chaos of Chicago streets and the violence that had surrounded him for so long. Though it didn't mean all his troubles were behind him, LA allowed him to focus more on his music and business ventures. However, drama still seemed to follow. Keith got into a high-profile beef with rapper 6 9 who loved stirring up trouble with other artists. Chief Keith. Lil Reese, all of them. And then there was the infamous incident involving producer Ramsey the Great, who accused Keith of robbery and assault. I done produced a song for him, met him a couple times, I didn't think none of him was wrong. I opened the door, boom, he pushed me in, a behind him got a Draco AK-47 looking thing. He started hitting me in the face, Tato started hitting me in the face. While the situation looked serious at first, Keith ended up beating the case and avoiding further legal problems. Fast forward a few years, and it became clear that Keith was evolving not just as an artist, but as a businessman. In 2021, he launched his own label, 43B, short for Forget Everybody, showing that he was no longer just thinking about his own career, but also about helping the next generation of rappers. He started signing new artists, giving them a platform to shine much like how he had burst onto the scene years earlier.